it is it is 12 noon by my computer. Uh, and I know people are still joining. I mean, we have quite a few. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you to mute, if you would. Uh, and I'm going to ask everybody who's on, please stay. Uh, your, your mic should be muted when you come on. Please stay muted uh, until uh, Jim has finished his presentation. And we will have time for questions and answers uh, at the end of the presentation. If you do have questions that you want to put forth and you either do or don't want to come on uh, on voice, you can put your questions in the chat and we will get to them during the Q&A. Um, my name is Jeffrey Cohen. I am the director of Zahut International in the United States. And uh, I met, uh, well, I can't say I met Jim, but the first time I was in contact with Jim, uh, he sent me a, a, an email as he was trying to get in touch with Moshe Peglin to uh, send him a copy of the book that had, had recently come out. And uh, so I, as in my correspondence with Jim, I asked him if he would send me a copy as well. He did. Uh, I read the book and I was floored. <laughs> just fascinated by the whole thing, uh, at which time I got in touch with him uh, and I wanted to bring him up to New York to give his presentation here and give it to the different Jewish communities in this area. However, <coughs> logistics uh, didn't allow for that at the time, whether it was timing, whether it was whatever. Uh, and then of course we had uh, COVID hit and all plans got dashed. Uh, but now with the rise of Zoom, um, I thought it prudent. I thought a really good thing that we, Jim should uh, have this Zoom session uh, for as many as we can get. Uh, this, this session is being recorded, so, and it will be posted. And uh, the, the link will be emailed to everyone who registered for this uh, session. <coughs> now, um, so that's how... I met Jim, so to speak, but Jim is, uh, Jim made his living as a police officer, fire investigator. Um, and in 1991, uh, he dedicated a part of his life to studying Jewish texts, the Tanakh uh, and the Torah. And Jim's studies placed him on a path to, uh, to introdu get introduced to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and apparently, reluctantly, he got uh, interested in the Copper Scroll. And most people don't know about the Copper Scroll. Most everyone knows and has seen the, you know, what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. And most of them are Jewish texts or you know, letters and things that, that were found in different caves um, in the Dead Sea area. Uh, so Jim didn't get interested in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls until after he met with uh, Vendel Jones. Vendel Jones was a, an archaeologist who was spent a good part of his life studying the Copper Scroll. Uh, and Jim decided to put his uh, award-winning investigative skills to the test. And as the Copper Scroll had been translated several times, had been researched quite a bit, Still no one knew where to start looking uh, for this list of items. Uh, but Jim, after examining it, made some discoveries. And I'm, I'm not going to go into it any further here, but uh, I'm going to let Jim give his presentation. And I hope you all enjoy it. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Barfield. I'm uh, with the Copper Scroll Project. And uh, Jeffrey, I'm assuming you got me set up to share. I will in one second, and now you okay. are, now you can. All right, well, I am going to give you guys a presentation. I, I normally call it, call it a disclosure because it's far more than just a, uh, a class I'm giving. I'm going to actually so, show you locations, and I'm going to show you why we're so excited about the Copper Scroll, uh, the project and the research that we've done. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the slideshow and get started.
And now can every, Jeffrey, can you see that okay? Yes, yes I can. Great, well, we're gonna start from here. This is my wife and I, uh, this was taken just a couple of years ago. Uh, Laurie has been the greatest help to me, uh, bar none. She does all my proofreading and takes care of all of my, uh, my homework that I've got to get accomplished for the project. Oops. Uh, let, me, let me explain to you the goal. The goal of the Copper Scroll Project, once I realized that I had uh, figured out how to understand the Copper Scroll, I wanted to ensure that I did everything that I could to assist the people of Israel to recover the treasures of their great nation and help restore their identity in preparation for the coming kingdom. I, I don't know if you're religious, I am, and I'm gonna come out of it from a religious perspective. And I want you guys to understand that uh, as we go through this, uh, we've got one hour for the presentation. So I need you to grab a pencil and paper, take some notes, write down your questions, and I'll try to answer them after we finish. Remember, the history and dating of the Copper Scroll are very important, but they have no bearing on the process to understand the Copper Scroll. All of the Copper Scroll project information too, by the way, is copyright protected. Academic discoveries from the research. These are some of the things that we've uh, identified and <clears throat> on top of figuring out where the treasures are located, biblical importance of the ruins of Qumran, the names and structures used at, Qum, at the Qumran ruins. The research provides insight into the occupations uh, and, uh, of the, day, the occupants' daily life at Qumran. We figured out the purpose of the Greek letters embedded on the Copper Scroll. There are locations that are aligned in it and they direct the reader to a cave of treasures. The information also provides uh, locations of where the Azazel goat uh, events took place. Not 100% sure on it, but I may cover some of that if we have time at the end of the program. We also provide, um, identi we identify the locations of the House of Hakals, a treasury that they've been searching for for years. We pinpoint the locations of the home of the Teacher of Righteousness at the Qumran community. We provide information that, Jer uh, that proves that Jeremiah uh, had a role in clandestine operation of the Copper Scroll. We also uh, have located writings of Haggai at the Qumran entrance, the ancient Qumran entrance. Uh, we also have uh, clues into the mysterious Melchizedek order. And we also are going to bring to light the Qumran or the Qumruslam phenomenon. I'll explain that in just a bit. This is a nearly identical copy of the Copper Scroll created by me for display at Copper Scroll events. Uh, what is the Copper Scroll? Found in a cave near the Dead Sea, the Copper Scroll is a great metal list of 57 hiding locations uh, for large amounts of treasures. The embedded Hebrew wording, however, transforms the document into a verbal map made up of three sheets of copper riveted together to create a seven foot long scroll. Five men recorded their cryptic information, guiding the reader to perhaps the most uh, portentous icons in Jewish history that may include items from the Temple of Solomon and the Tabernacle of Moses. The distinctive copper writing surface implies that the document was intended to survive for a very long time. As the scroll states, at the appointed time, the scroll will reveal the endowment to Israel or a endowment to Israel. A well-known rabbi and temple activist told me that the treasures of Qumran are the dowry for the coming bride. Guys, I believe it. I think it, it's, it's such an incredible amount. It'd be an amazing wedding gift for the bride uh, to Hashem. The history behind the Copper Scroll. And understand the history is not important to, to figure out where these locations are at. The chronicle presented today is purely for context. The Jewish year was approximately 3331. Nebuchadnezzar forces had attacked Qumran. Valiant priests 
fought and won that battle, but the community he was destroyed and his uh, leaders were deeply concerned about the security of the immense treasures within its walls. The situation was so desperate that there was no choice. The priest had to bury the wealth immediately or risk losing them forever. According to the documents listed on the next slide, Shemur Halevi, who was in charge, uh, the four dedicated young men responsible for hiding the most important treasures on earth, but how could they preserve that information to last 70 years or even much longer? A book from the 1600s called the Mech HaMelech uh, states that the men embedded that information on a Luok Nehoshe, a copper plate. The Copper Scroll Validating Documents, Emek Hamelek, uh, found in the synagogue in Cairo, Egypt, gives a detailed look into the Copper Scroll event. The Ezekiel Tablets, found in Ezekiel's tomb in Iraq, further dates the writing of the Copper Scroll to the year 3331, during the time of Jeremiah. The five scribes on the Copper Scroll were listed on uh, both documents. Their names were Shemur Halibi, Hezekiah, Zedekiah, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah, son of Edu the prophet. All the men were co contemporaries with Jeremiah. Below is a facsimile of the entire copper scroll as it looked after the writers completed their task and riveted the three sheets together. The scroll should, uh, the scroll would soon be rolled and placed into a cave for long-term storage. The scroll snapped in two at a rivet line as, an ancient, as the ancient writers attempted to roll the scroll for concealment. The two rolls you see here are actually one complete document as riveted, uh, as depicted in the previous slide. The two rolls were taken to cave three about one mile north of Qumran and hidden. Here you can see, if you can see my cursor, that's Qumran down here, and at the top is Cave 3. That's about a mile difference or distance from uh, Qumran. Here's an actual picture of the cave, or a, not an actual picture, but a drawing of, of the cave. On the left is the interior map of the cave showing uh, the ledge where the Copper Scroll was found in 1952. A slab from the roof had actually collapsed, forming a false wall hiding the scroll from plain view. You can see here, they kind of marked how that slab had fallen down. This is uh, cave three. I'm gonna show you a quick video and kind of give you a perspective where it's at from Qumran. As you see, the gentleman is flying backwards so he can, you can look into cave three. And on the left, watch and you'll see uh, there is a cave coming up. It's called the Cave of the Column named that I believe by a guy named Bindle Jones. Bindle was quite the character if you know anything about him. And there it is and you can see the distance uh, for even for there, there, it's quite a distance to Cave 3, especially in that terrain. This is, uh, this is uh, the Copper Scroll as it set on the cave a ledge. Imagine if we're correct, several of the men that last touched this scroll were prophets from the Bible. Again, they took a lot of care uh, with every step of the procedure to prevent any harm or loss of detail from the map because just looking at it, they could see on the exterior that the copper scroll uh, had information about treasures. The rolled metal set on the small ledge in K3 until 1952 when the archeological team brought the fragile uh, scroll into the light for the first time in two millennium. Tarnished and brittle, the copper sheets uh, sh shattered at the lightest pressure when they attempted to reveal the fortune veiled beneath the copper layers. John Allegro, part of the De Jordanian Dead Sea Scroll team at that time, arranged for the scroll to be taken to Manchester University in England to determine a way to reveal its secrets. Here's an actual video of them opening this scroll. Assisted by Henry Wright Baker, John Legro constructed a crude device made of old army materials and tools from a university dental class 
produced a producing a machine with a circular blade, a spindle, a cradle, a vacuum, and an attached uh, fan to blow away the dust. As you can see in this short video, Baker is slicing the copper scroll into 23 pieces. That night, after 2,400 years, the scroll revealed its long kept secrets. After cutting the scroll, Allegro made a preliminary translation of the contents, which he considered to be a list as every, of Israel's treasures hidden at various locations around Israel. And you can see the words that were tapped, hammered into, if you will, into that copper. This is, is a display in Amman, Jordan. Jordan controlled the ancient valley of Akora at that time, at the time the copper scroll was discovered, and still maintains control of the document. The five writers. Think about this. In a moment, you may be looking at the actual handwriting of two prophets from the Bible, Haggai and Zechariah. This is writer number one, and those in red are Greek um, notations, and I'll tell you about that here in a few minutes. This is writer number two. He had uh, columns three, four, and uh, three, four, five, and six. Writer four, let me move this out of my way. I'm sorry, writer three. Had low, uh, columns six, seven, and eight. Writer five had low, oops, I'll skip one, sorry guys. Rider four had eight, nine, 10, and 11, and rider five had a little bit of column 11 and all of column 12. So we'll notice if you will, there are 12 columns on this document. The Greek letters, let me explain a little bit about that. Here are the Greek letters. There's, that's not all of them. There's one more I'm not gonna show you right now. But each one of those Greek letters, they, they couldn't figure out why in the world they put Greek on top of this, uh, in this copper scroll. I think I figured it out. There are seven clusters of Greek letters found on the copper scroll and by matching the Greek letters with the Hebrew equivalent numerical value of the clusters, form, uh, they form Hebrew words and that are in a term that is reminiscent, reminiscent of a term of endearment from the book of Isaiah. This is Isaiah 4 to 3, 20. I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my elect. This is from the Copper Scroll. In the wilderness, the hand of the priest gives drink of the spirit of grace in the sixth age. When will these treasures be found? In the book, Emek Hamelek, this is what it is said. They concealed the vessels of the temple and the wealth of the treasures that were in Jerusalem, which will not be discovered until the day of the coming of the Messiah, the son of David, speedily in our times, amen, and so it will be. This is from uh, 2 Maccabees. And Jeremiah came and found the hollow cave and he took the tent, the ark, the altar of incense into it, and he blocked up the entrance. The place shall be unknown until God reveals the congregation of his people together and he shows his mercy. Then God will show where the tabernacle, the ark, and the, and the altar are, and the glory of God will be revealed as it was revealed in the days of Moses. Well, in the days of Moses, it was revealed in the wilderness, and Qumran is in the wilderness. This is from the Apocalypse of Baruch. The um, Chaldeans, the uh, Babylonian army had surrounded Jerusalem and Baruch was lamenting over the captivity of the people uh, of Israel. Verse seven. And I saw the angel descend into the Holy of Holies and take from there the veil, the Holy Ark, the mercy seat, two tablets, the holy raiment of the priest, the altar of incense, 48 precious stones wherewith the priest was adorned and all the holy vessels of the tabernacle. And he spoke to the earth with a loud voice saying, earth, 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 hear the word of the mighty God and uh, receive what I commit to you and guard them until the last day so that when you are ordered, you may restore them. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, my buddy Chris Knight and I actually knelt down at the opening where we believe that cave is at, and we ordered the, uh, the earth to release the items. It didn't work. So we're going to give it another try. When the research was complete, we headed to Israel. But not before I talked to this lady. I was doing a uh, class at a Comanche Nation College here in Lawton, Oklahoma, and this lady told me she had heard about my research and I did a presentation for them. She told me that she could help me with the project. And I'd ask her, uh, you know, a Comanche lady from Lawton, Oklahoma, what could she do? Well, you know what? She knew this guy. This is Shuka Dorfman and his wife Talma. For, uh, he was the head of the Antiquities Authority of Israel. And he, um, he, she arranged for me to meet this guy. This is a Citadel, Citadel Hotel in downtown Jerusalem. Well, after I showed him about five minutes of my research, he stopped me and he set up this meeting. This is the first meeting with, uh, with Shuga Dorfman, Yuval Peleg, and Yitzhak Magan. Yitzhak Magan was the head of the Antiquities Authority, actually the Antiquities Department of the Civil Administration, which is Judea Samaria. Uh, now I'm going to get to the good stuff. The guy in the next picture provided amazing help to the project and has some serious chutzpah. This is Moshe Faglin. I bet a hundred bucks, uh, all of you, but except maybe four or five, have uh, know exactly who this guy is. Moshe got involved. Um, hold on, I have something blocking my way here the chief staff officer of archaeology for Judea Samaria, which was, is now Hanania Hizmi, received a disclosure of my research and shortly after a request to do an environmentally friendly, non-invasive scan of Qumran, the Qumran ruins, led by a well-known archaeologist by the name of Orrin Gutfeld. Hizmi denied the scan and closed Qumran to excavations. Hizmi's reason that he gave me we need to let Qumran rest. Well, this guy got involved. This is a planning session that, that we did in um, around the uh, airport. This is Mike Kaiser, Chris Knight, Moshe, of course, myself, and Joe Whipple. Since Moshe was the deputy speaker of the Knesset at the time, he didn't uh, require the usual permits for a scan. Scan. He did. Uh, he had diplomatic immunity, so Moshe bypassed all the red tape and assisted the Copper Scroll team to scan four locations at Qumran. Would you like to see the results? We're going to go through into the uh, disclosure right now, and I'm going to show you the results. Uh, the day the research began to began, I selected the best Copper Scroll translation available from the Dead Sea Scroll Study Edition. In fact. Using the Martinez translation, it made it possible to identify five locations, the first five. But Martinez also assumed that the treasure was scattered all over Israel. That's where they made their mistakes. So the, uh, the red line shows the Martinez translation. Here's Martinez's book, uh, Mar uh, Florentino Garcia's Martinez, the co-author of the book, the Dead Sea Scroll Study Edition, gave me permission to use his translation in my project research. This is a, a facsimile. The red line indicates a facsimile right off of uh, the actual scroll. This is modern Hebrew used to help those not familiar with the ancient Hebrew font. This is a literal translation and this is a catalog number. They're used to, to they're placed it so we could easily identify the translation for further evaluation. Since I'm not a Hebrew linguist, the best I could do was piece the words together to form a sentence. And guys, it worked amazingly well. Uh, by the way, a lot of the spelling on the ancient Copper Scroll is not the same as today. The first line of the Copper Scroll is the most critical to establish the key to understand the Copper Scroll. If you're a man, this concept may be hard to accept because you must follow the instructions as they are presented. If you do, you complete the first step of understanding the scroll. And this is how it works. The treasures are under 
the ruins in the valley of Accor. Find the ruins, ruins, and you find the treasures. But which ruins? The second step is use simple logic and figure out which ruins to examine. Let's use common sense approach and try the ruins. Uh, and I tried the ruins in the midst of the Dead Sea Scroll Caves. Qumran. If those ruins had not matched the features described on the Copper Scroll, I had planned to move to the next set of ruins in that area. However, Qumran matched perfectly. Here's uh, an, a map showing you a location of Qumran in the Valley of Accor. Before we go any further, I wanted, I wanted to do a quiz. This is, a, I call it the Jerusalem Geography Quiz. What Israeli city is this? I'll let you look at it a second. What city is this? And what city is this? Obviously, if you thought that the last slide was Jerusalem, you're wrong. It's Qumran. The Qumran community was laid out to represent a Jerusalem in the wilderness. In the following slide, the map on the left is Qumran's exterior walls and uh, the name structure locations as described on the Copper Scroll. The map on the right is Jerusalem during the time of Jer uh, Jeremiah showing the same structures situated identical to those on the Copper Scroll. But notice the compass headings. On the left, I'm gonna get my, my uh, cursor, work, cursor work in here. Here's the fountain. Here's the fountain gate. Here's the pool of Siloam, which is a double entry pool. And here's the atonement mikvah at Qumran. It too is a double entry. Here is the water system at uh, Jerusalem. Here is the water system in Qumran. Here's the temple. Here's the Zadok's residence or the righteous one's residence. This is the column of Boaz at the temple, and there is a column of Boaz at Zadok's residence. Sheep's pool and sheep's gate in Jerusalem, sheep's pen, ram's pen at Qumran. Women's house and uh, women's gate here, I'm sorry. These are the what is watchtower at Qumran, watchtowers at Jerusalem. The Essene courtyard, and this is the Essene quarter in the Essene gates in Jerusalem. This scale drawing uh, is Qumran. It was created uh, by me for the Copper Scroll Research. The details identify areas that would make it, oops, sorry, that would make it difficult for the diggers to, un, uh, to dig under, well, they were under attack because they were, they were under a threat of attack at the time they were burying these things. To hide the burdensome, burdensome treasures, they took, they took a lot of effort and the plan moved really quickly. Once I figured this out, the plan moved really quickly and narrowed down the search and expedited the results of my findings. This is a uh, overhead view or a drone footage that I took and I got uh, this picture from. Location one, we're actually gonna do the locations. Now I'm gonna show you where these things are at. Guys, don't be grabbing your shovels and heading for uh, Qumran or for Israel. They guard that place like Fort Knox. Location one, the steps extending east. At the steps extending east toward 40 cubits long are silver service vessels weighing 17 talents. The steps are extending east. They, these are the clues. They're 40 cubits long, and they have an area that will hold 17 talents of silver. Guys, that's a lot of silver. Do you, any of you see steps extending east? I'll show you, right there. These are the only steps extending east at Qumran, but they are exactly, well, near exactly 40 cubits long. A close up, and here is a, um, the same two guys that uh, I met with, uh, the head of the Antiquities Authority, Yitzhak Mag and Yuval Peleg. The steps are 19.5 meters long, which is 767.71 inches. A cubit is 19 inches long. So let's divide that and you come up with exactly or near exactly, probably the width of your finger, short of 40 cubits. So that worked out great, but it could have been a coincidence. Here's an area that was certainly big enough to bury 17 talents of vessels. And you can see the Dead Sea in the background. I'll see if I can 
right here. Okay, this is what we hope to find. Silver service vessels. Of course, these are modern day, but I didn't have any to take pictures of. Location two, 900 talents of polished gold. I'm gonna wake you guys up now. Accommodated in the mound of, uh, built mound of the dry cistern is gold. In the dry fountain of the great ruined courtyard of the peristyle, in the soft mire, which is mud, is hidden polished gold in front of the highest opening. The clues, dry cistern, we need a fountain, we need a large courtyard, which is called the mikvah, uh, mikvah, I'm sorry, a peristyle on the document. We need mud or what used to be mud, and we need to have a high opening at Qumran. If you'll note, this cistern coming in is the dry cistern. There's the fountain. This is the peristyle. It goes all the way around it. Like again, it's a large wall courtyard. This is where the mud would have been. It's dry now, of course. And this is the highest opening. The large courtyard, there are two courtyards at Qumran. There's a very large courtyard and a small one we're gonna talk about here again in a little bit. This is the location for 900 uh, talents of gold. Now, whenever Moshe Faglin and I and the crew went out there, we, we scanned this area here. We went back and forth as required by the, uh, uh, the machine, and we passed right by this, this 900 talents of gold. We didn't go over the top of it. Again, that's how you scan it. That's the pattern you have to use. Let's see Moshe's Qumran scans. The Lorenzi one is an ex excellent metal detector. It penetrates far past the required depth. The images are general shapes of objects under the ground. The colors orange, red and blue indicate gold, silver, uh, aluminum, which it would be none. Iron and steel is indicated by green. Look at that. This is the location I just showed you. I showed uh, these uh, images to the guy that built the computer or built the uh, device. He was begging me to tell him where this stuff was at. We actually picked up four locations uh, whenever we scanned that courtyard. But look at the amount here. It's an incredible amount, guys. Again, that's the location we're looking at. And the value, the scroll says the location too contains 900 talents of gold, uh, weighs approximately 75 pounds each. With gold at $1,700 per ounce, the value is 16, oh, almost $2 billion. But you gotta remember, don't forget, these treasures are for the dowry for the bride and nothing else. Location three, the cave of treasures. In the red heap are wine vessels, the gleaming chamber, the ephod, and the entire tenth of tithe the pouring vessels from the treasury. Here are the clues. Red heap, we have a, a cave uh, with a large entrance, and there is uh, a treasury involved. Okay, here's Qumran for an aerial view of it. This is during the spring many years ago. Anybody on, in the audience see a red hill? Obviously there it is. Wine vessels are supposed to be there, but what is an afod? The afod is a breastplate or the breastplate of the high priest. And what is a gleaming chamber? That's the interior portion of the tabernacle. This is an indication of the uh, representation of the tabernacle, but the uh, uh, first temple, second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and Herod's temple all had gold, polished gold on the walls, which makes a gleaming chamber when you introduce the Shekinah glory and the menorah inside of that room. The treasury <clears throat> named in L3, location three, uh, we're going to be looking at that closer. Describes you several names of the same building for the same building because the structure had several uses. The names are the treasury, the house of a cause, the house of the slanting guard post treasury, and the high place, the citadel. As I mapped the previous locations, another major and clever crew a uh, clue became obvious. Location three is wildly important because writer one and writer five 
use the same cave to secure the copper scroll items. And this scribe uh, created a sign pointing the way. Watch this. Location one, location two, and location three, where the, all these items are buried at. I don't think that's a coincidence, guys. The first three locations <clears throat> were aligned in, uh, in an ascending order up a gradual slope to an exact point. There's some more to this clue, which I'll show you in just a second. Location four, the double entry mechba. Every person that saw this one just slapped their forehead and realized that we were onto something. Matter of fact, this is where Shuka Dwarfman, the head of the Antiquities Authority stopped me. He was so excited about it. At the double entry pool with the entrance by the north edge of the community, six cubits against a white immersion pool of oblation rising from the soil and goes down into the left and is high above the soft mud, dig three cubits for 40 silver talents. The clues are like friction ridges and in arches and whirls of a fingerprint. The more the match, the stronger the evidence is. Watch this. <clears throat> there are 10 of them here. One is north edge of the community. Two, we got a pool. Three, is it a mikba? Yes, it is. Uh, five, you have to go down and to the left to enter. And we have the secondary uh, opening, which is the exit for the uh, mikba. The mikba is white. The sides must be six cubits. This side here must be six cubits long, and it is. This pool is the highest, geographically speaking, of all the uh, mechbas and pools at Qumran, and it is also high above the soil. Their location, or clue number 10, you've got a lot of mud, or it used to be a lot of mud. Here's the actual pool. You have to enter, go down into the left. National Parks Authority plastered the mechba with the original white color. This is my buddy Chris Knight and Shelly Neese, the writer of our book. Was this structure a mikvah? <clears throat> now listen, I spent an hour surveying every inch of the pool, taking samples, pictures from every angle and detailed measurements to show the rabbis so they could tell me whether it was a mikvah or not. Then my wife poked me and said, hey, Mr. Investigator, read the sign you're leaning against. And there's the sign. It actually said on there, ritual bath, which all of you know, is a mikvah. What should we find? 40 silver talents. And guys, that's pretty much how much silver will be there. Location number 29, the house of a cause. In the open spot, towards the area of the assembly and for proclamations, dig six cubits from the house of a cause. Find six judgment ties of silver. The clues? In the open spot, 10 feet from the house of a cause, there has to be an open area from the corner. To, and you have to be in the direction, going in the direction of the assembly and proclamations. And we're supposed to find a lot of silver there. Listen to this, <clears throat> the priestly course of a cause. If you don't know about it, read Second Chronicles 24-7. Uh, they, the guy was a, a, the treasurer. In Nehemiah 3, 4, it says, And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Colts. In Ezra 8, 33, Now on the fourth day was the silver and gold and vessels weighed in the house of God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, the son of Colts. So he was, that's just proving that he was, that family was a treasure. This is the house of a cause. Now guys have been looking for this place and it was in plain sight the whole time. What should we find? Six judgment ties of silver. Oops, location 32, the slanting guard post treasury. Enter this place from the Eastern path to the Boken house of the slanting guard post treasury. There are juice vessels. Near are all the scrolls and zealous writings of Haggai by the exterior. Dig seven cubits between the support stones. The main entry, 
is one of the clues, Eastern path, rubble, a house with uh, slanting walls. It's a guard post and it was a treasury. And believe me guys, looking this thing over, you'll see why they used it as a treasury. It's thick and enormous. And we're looking for two support stones. Why would this writer bury the scrolls of Haggai as part of the treasures and in a place where the Qumran sect enters into the wilderness city of Jerusalem? The rules of the congregation says, and this is the rule of the congregation of Israel in the final days, when they gathered the community to walk in accordance with the regulations of the sons of Zadok, the priests and the men of the covenant who are turned away from the path, then, uh, when they come, they shall assemble all those who come, including the women and children, and they shall read it into their ears, all the precepts of the covenant, and shall instruct them in all the regulations so that they do not stray in their errors. And this is the rule of the armies of the congregation for all the native Israelites from his youth. They shall educate them in the books of Haggai according to his age, instruct him in the precepts of the covenant. What they had to do is before they entered into this covenant or into this community, they had to know all these, including the books of Haggai. Apparently there's more books than just the one that we have in the uh, Tanakh. So, to enter into Jerusalem in the wilderness, each person had to know Torah, the rules of the community, the books of Haggai, and find uh, and to find the books of Haggai, one has to dig at the entrance of the community. And guys, that just makes sense to me. <laughs> Here is the building with the slow, sloping walls. It's also the guard post. It's the treasury. Look how thick the walls are on this thing. And the building was broken. This is the rubble, and you're entering from the eastern path and you're going into the community through that entrance. Slanting guard post walls, uh, but there are no columns at Qumran today, or are there? And by the way, this is a scan area that we're gonna see here in just a few minutes. There inside of a room, just a few uh, feet away from that location, you see the columns are still there, or at least parts of the columns are still there. This is the scan. Guys, this is huge. This is a huge, huge amount of, of silver, and I had no idea we were gonna pick it up, but we did. We scanned it, we did the same back and forth, uh, and we found that location, which is location 32 that we're looking at. There's a uh, look at the red arrows, and you'll see on the right, the scan. There's the uh, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, actually there's a sixth one, but it was so small I couldn't get it uh, on there. So all of them match up just exactly as the Copper Scroll Project uh, research says. What should we find? Juice vessels. And the zealous writings of Haggai. Location 37, the residence of anoint for anointing the prophets. At the edge of the broken residence for anointing, at the edge, is six, from, is six cubits, dig and behold, at the appointed time, a great quantity. From the edge of the broken residence for anointed prophets to the edge, there's a space of six cubits, uh, 60 cubits, I'm sorry, and we're watching for the appointed time. Was that the 70 years in Jeremiah's prophecy? Don't know. But there are the 60 cubits. Here is the actual picture of it, and that is exactly 60 cubits. And here's again of the results that we showed you earlier. This portion here, it's no longer there except for a little small section of it. So I believe that was probably used for the temple of Zerubbabel's temple. And that's what we're looking for, a massive quantity of silver talents. Double ditch. Two, uh, <clears throat> two judgment offerings are concealed 40 cubits end to end to double ditch is the breadth of the citadel. On the east side, dig uh, cubits and find the allotment of uh, talents in the dirt by the uh, high place. Offerings, cubits, end to end, double ditch, here we go. Here's the upper ditch, here's the lower ditch, and both of those are end to end. The eastern wall is 40 cubits long, 
and all the information is exactly as I told you. And what do we hope to find? That, a lot of it. Call him a Boaz. Called together, massing at the residence with the righteous speaks by the sheep are two crown stones of proud Boaz. Our talents draw out 390 accumulation of atonement vessels. This is what we're gonna be looking for. We have the, the uh, chamber where the righteous ones, uh, teacher of righteousness slept. We're looking for two capstones and we're looking for the treasures by a sheep's pen. Look guys, the capstones are still there. The place where the teacher, this is his door to his room. That's the place where he would have stood in that same court, small courtyard I told you about earlier. But I had to look again and do some intensive investigation to figure out if this was a sheep's pen or not. I figured it was, and I took my wife's advice and I started reading the signs. And guess what? That's exactly what they call it. The guys at Qumran call this a sheep's pen. What should we find? Gold platters and a lot of uh, vessels. We're going to skip over this one. I want to get to the, the next one. Location number 57. This is a cave of treasures. In the great hollow entry, which involves all the wealth of the house, all the weight is counted. And I have no clue how many talents that is, but it's a lot. Placed and hidden in a dry entrance on the north side of the red heap, and it is buried by the edge is another copy of the record, declaring the scattered words and trap well united they are one. We're looking, all the wealth of the house is combined, uh, Second Maccabees and Mechamelech and the Copper Scrolls state the following items are in that area of Qumran. The Mishkan of the Tabernacle, the Altar of Incense, the Table of Showbread, the Ephod, uh, in a sealed cave, the Ark of the Covenant. The cave of treasures are buried and sealed in a great hollow entry. Again, the red heap. I mapped this one out just like I did uh, location number three. This scribe used the same method as writer one to point the way so we would not miss this location because it is incredibly important. There's location 53, 54, 55, 56 and 57. They form a straight line all the way to that location. Matter of fact, all three of those locations <clears throat> were aligned so well in order, ascending up to the cave, uh, that, they, that they lined up and that line that I drew on there completely covered the locations where those treasures are located at. That's 493 meters from this location to the cave. Again, these are the things we're looking for. A uh, place for large enough for the um, uh, hollow entry. The entrance must be on the north side of the hill. The area must be situated away from water. Entrance must be buried by an edge. Both locations, 3 and 57, converge at the same point. Second Maccabees and the Copper Scrolls says the entrance is sealed. The um, Second Maccabees and the Copper Scroll refer to the opening as the Great Hollow Entry. Two companies tested the mortar on the cave and both concluded the mortar was most likely man-made. This is the extreme north end of the hill. There is room in this area where we suspect that the cave is buried. And there's also a sinkhole here, which means there's a void under there somewhere. The opening is obviously buried, if that is, I'm in fact correct. This stone gauntlet is just like all the other caves around Qumran. It has ca uh, stones pointing in towards the entrance. The, we found mortar at this location too, and we had it tested. And is it by the edge? This is where I took the photo you just saw. I had to back up to get the, uh, the cave in the frame because the camera I was using was a cheap one. This is the very first time I was at Qumran. If I'd have taken another step backwards, I would have found out what they meant by the edge. At the time, I didn't know. 
but I was standing right on this cliff whenever I took that picture and I had no idea until I turned around to check things out. This is an artist uh, rendering of the Cave of Treasures. This is the area where we scanned, where Moshe Faglin uh, jumped on board with us and he did work the controls and I did the scanning or we carried it for him. The following image <clears throat> from the Z1 is using different frequencies, showing what appears to be large piles of non-ferrous metals just inside and below the place where Moshe Faglin and the Copper Scroll team scanned just west of the suspected cave entrance. Look at that. One, two, three, four, actually five, six, seven, eight. These are small, even, even these little bumps are indications that there's something there. But this is just a small area inside of a very large cave and hopefully there's no anomalies here. This is the more important of the uh, frequencies. When you look at it, look at how these things tower. Again, the guy that uh, built this detector was begging to know where this location was at. What should we find in this cave? If in fact we're correct, according to second Maccabees, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle itself is supposed to be inside of a cave in that region. And I absolutely believe it's the spot we've identified. What should we find according to the cover scroll? All the wealth of the house. The house they're talking about, you guess. I am thinking the Beitamic Dash, the temple. What would happen if the treasures of the temple were found? Kohanim are being trained in Israel for tabernacle services. And guys, if that tabernacle is inside of that cave, guess what? There are red heifers being made ready for the ashes. Also, every ancient document related to the Copper Scroll states that when these treasures are found, it will be the time of the regathering of the nation of Israel and or the coming of the Messiah. I am positive that we understand the cover scroll. Uh, it, and are the treasures still there? It sure looks like it, guys. Please help me make some Jewish connections and arrange for speaking arrange, uh, engagements for Jewish audiences in the United States and in Israel. Most importantly, tell everyone you know in the land, help us help Israel recover the dowry. Again, just a simple test Give me a, a shovel, let me and my buddies, Mac, uh, Mac Kaiser, Chris Knight, uh, Gilad Rosinger, all of us go over there and do dig and give us one day and we even know for sure if those items are still there. How can you help? Israel is currently operating a program called the Operation Scroll. There are had several million dollars available to conduct searches excavations, operations to recover and collect protected uh, and protect Israel's national heritage and artifacts of national value. Can anyone in this room think of anything of greater historic importance to the heritage, heritage of Israel than these items? The former director of Masada, Etan Campbell, introduced me to the director of the Israeli Heritage Foundation, uh, Ruben Pinsky. Within 15 minutes, Reuben was on board with me and after he saw the disclosure. And he, he was sure that he could get the IAA and the ADCA to work with me. When he got to the ADCA, however, all the communication stopped. The guy that was in charge was Hananya Hizmi, the same guy that refused to let us do a simple scan at Qumran. And guys, that guy better know, never go to Las Vegas and play poker, because when I was showing him the disclosure, his eyes were bugging out. He knew that something big was going on, but he refused to let us do anything. What, was, what we must do is have form a coalition and have it in place for the appointed time. Write to me if you have any interest in helping build a coalition. Guys, I'm not asking you for money. I want you to help me get support and convince the Israelis to do the excavation or finish 
the excavation that we actually started in 2009. Is uh, Galad Roslinger, is, do you have him online? A matter of fact, I'm gonna end the slideshow or stop the slideshow. Galad, are you there? If not, I was gonna have Galad uh, say a few words. He's, uh, he's from Israel. Galad is the, uh, he's the um, CEO of Radiant Israel Tours. He's been out there with me to Qumran and he's seen all of these locations. And guys, if you think it was convincing, and I hope you did, it's 10 times more convincing when you're standing there actually looking at it. Chris Knight, are you available? Chris Knight's the uh, uh, assistant director of the Copper Scroll Project. And Chris, I'd like for you to get online and say what, uh, what you'd like to say. No, I just considered it an honor. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up. Yeah, we hear you. All right, great, yeah. Um, well, as you know, I've been on the project since the beginning. Um, you know, he, he showed his wife first, but right after he started making the discoveries, if you read the book, you know the story. Jim began to communicate with me, and through this process, um, I came along, Jim, and we've been going to Israel, uh, I can't tell you how many times. I think in one year we went six times in one year. The, that first year we were just going back to back. And since then, the mission of the project has been to get the antiquities authorities, mainly the Archaeological Department of Civil Administration, uh, the ADCA, because all these things are in the West Bank, uh, to do a dig. And we've got the scan. We did a dig in 2009, but there's still yet to be a thorough scan of, and, and a dig of all locations. And until that's complete, our mission isn't done. Jim has been faithful in what, Jim, I think we've been going 12 years or so now, as in 2006, he made the discovery. We've been going back and forth. And, you know, Jim has been faithful in beating on the door, showing the presentation, getting the word out there. But ultimately, it's going to come down to this day where we can get the research, go out to Qumran, and we can confirm it one way or the other. I'm fully convinced that Jim has found the locations. Now it's just a matter of what's out there. If all the items are there that we think are there, it's, it's going to be the greatest archaeological find ever. It's the redemption of Israel. It's the restoration of the mercy. It's the time of the gathering. I mean, the biggest events that are ever going to unfold as we move into the millennial reign of the becoming Messiah, the, uh, the, uh, the impact is enormous. And I always like to think, you know, of the establishment of the ark is the establishment of mercy coming to Israel. So huge. what Jim has figured out, the research is huge. And you all being connected with Israel like you are, we always have a heart and a passion for you guys because you never know who is one relationship away from that one person that may go into the ADCA or to Netanyahu or, or Pinsky or any of those heads and say, hey, you need to take time to confirm whether this stuff is there or not. It's way too valuable to ignore it. And so we need our Jewish brothers, we need our friends to bridge this gap between Jim's research and the powers to be to get out there and to confirm it. Ultimately, it's all in Father's timing. You know, we know that he put these things there and if they are there, they are set and destined to come out at a certain time. So I just thank you all for even taking the time and listening and listening to Jim's research. I hope it stirred your hearts. I hope it brought hope. I hope it encouraged you, if anything. And if anything, whenever you think of us, pray for us. Pray that God will, will lead us. Pray for the right connections of the bridges. If you think you can help, then by God, we are all willing to talk to you. So, Jeffrey, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for all that you do. And uh supporting Jim and making those connections. Uh, I really appreciate that as well. It's been yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's, it's been wonderful. And now I'd, li I'd like to open it up to questions uh, if anybody's got any. Jeffrey, what about you? you have any questions? I do. <laughs> hey, Nelson. <clears throat> Hi. Um, Jim, remember yes. you were in my house. That's where yes, you Yes, I sure do. Thank All you very right. much for that also. <laughs> All right. 
we are on the verge of making Aliyah, my wife and I. So uh, we hope to be able to uh, join you, all right, as it develops. But my, my biggest question is the political question. You know, who do we, who, who do we actually have to have, uh, you know, recognition from? Because the area is still, I think, disputed. Is it something that Israel is going to have to, you know, give back? It's, you know, I, it's a little bit unclear. You know, that's a great question. <clears throat> and we came about within, you know, a few inches of getting that uh, problem taken care of whenever Trump had uh, in initiated the paperwork to uh, get uh, get control over or to annex the Jordan Valley. Because all of this stuff is right there at Qumran in the Jordan Valley. Had he been able to get that accomplished before this crazy COVID stuff came along, uh, that wouldn't have been an issue. But yes, it is an issue. It is a problem. It's it's under Israeli control, but it's a it's a uh, it's a kind of still kind of shared with the Palestinians. So that would need to be taken care of prior to actually doing the excavation because we do not want to let one item, not one item, fall into anyone else's hands other than the nation of Israel. There also, there also has to be an educational process because a lot of people say, we're not ready for this. Look what happened with uh, the old city in 1967. The keys were given back, all right, to the old city. And that, you know, we have to make sure that the educational process is there so everybody knows how they're going to benefit from this by having spirituality come back into the world. The only way to say it. I totally agree with you. And that's what I'm doing now. Uh, that's what I'm doing now is trying to get everybody as educated as possible. And that's why I ask you guys, tell the people in Israel especially, all, all the uh, people around the country here, of course, uh, that would be that would be wonderful, and that education process is already underway. Thank you very much, Nelson. And uh, thank you. Oh, I Bush, have other uh, you got, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The Hoshua, have you got a question? Well, <clears throat> I just yeah, yeah I wrote it down. Um, well, I'm I'm just puzzled in regard to the Greek lettering in the scroll. Uh, why would there be Greek lettering if this was written right after the destruction or right before the destruction of the temple when the Greeks didn't arrive into Judea only a couple hundred years later? The good question, sir. Here's the thing. The guys at Kuman were required, as a lot of, uh, even to the day, uh, your rabbis, a lot of rabbis are required to speak at least one other language and this, that's what was going on then. They initiated that back in the time. So everybody thinks that, you know, that the uh, Greeks, or not everybody, that the Greeks weren't even in the area. Yeah, they were, guys. They were involved, and there was trading going on between all of them. So good question, but I'm telling you, I can't explain why they chose to use Greek, but I think it's to mask the, uh, the fact that this, that was a... Uh, more of a term of an endearment than anything else because no one's been able to figure that out. So, good question. Okay, thank you. I don't Brandon? know if Brandon, Brandon wants to ask this himself, but he wrote in the chat, what about Jewish tradition that maintains that the Ark is buried under the Temple Mount? Good, good question. And guys, I personally, I don't care who finds it. I just wanted to see it found. And, uh, you know, they, there's another guy who thinks that, or claims that it's uh, under Golgotha. Uh, just there's, in, some guys think it's in Oklahoma. I don't know. It's, it could be anywhere at this point. But in some, in some CIA I, warehouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there is, there's a lot of theories of where the Ark of the Covenant is that. Is that and seriously, I just want to see it found. That's what's important to me. But I've got a lot of um, ancient documentation showing that it's in this area. And with all the other items, and these men, one of the things you got to learn about Qumran 
is it's going to be second only to the Temple Mount someday. If these items are truly there, it's going to be enormous. And why would they put all these items, all these treasures at Qumran, other than the fact that it's like these men thought that money was a root of all evil. And the, here's the deal. The guys at Qumran loathe money. So it'd be like kind of leaving your wife with a eunuch, you know, you're pretty well safe uh, that nothing's going to happen to it at that point. So uh, next question. Uh, so Gerard Robbins typed in, he says, uh, does Moshe Feglin have the pull to get you a dig permit? And also, do you know why Vendel Jones never dug, dug in Qumran proper? Yeah, if, uh, first, uh, no, Moshe can't. I, I would love it if he could. Uh, that's a reason for forming a coalition. If we form a coalition, we could get you know, a more pull uh, with Israeli dignitaries, and have, I've got some people here in the United States, some uh, politi politicians that want to get involved in help with this. So that would be okay with me as well. But the Vendel Jones thing, Vendel Jones had no idea that these items were in Qumran. Vendel and I were, were friendly. We weren't really big friends, but we were friendly. And I showed him my research and he got very excited about it. He said, I, I'd never thought of this. And he was uh, very interested in, in what I did with the research. So he didn't even think that those items were at Qumran or in he, the Qumran ruins. He, if I'm correct, he thought they were at the cave of the column yep. or near that. Yep. In that video where we, everybody, where the video backs up. Yeah. That was on the left-hand side. That was the cave of the column where he thought that everything was. Right. For those of you, I mean, thank you for the question, Gerard. I know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Jim was able to dig at the site with Yuval Peleg. Uh, they did a test dig. Uh, however, uh, I think one thing that you didn't mention, most of these items are 12 feet deep, right? That's what it's, it's yes. basically, said. it gives their, their depth in the, in, on the scroll. And if I'm correct, the the test digs never went further than three feet. No, yeah, the, the deepest we went, well, I, I convinced Yuval Peleg, all, all I did was gave him a call. We were in Israel uh, after I met him the first time in that in the picture you saw. We were in Israel during what, what holiday was it, Lauren? Pesach, okay. We were in Israel during Pesach and I called his office and normally he wouldn't have been in the office. Uh, it was during Unleavened Bread, and I, I called him, and he answered the phone. And I said, Yuval, would you like to be the archaeologist for this excavation? And he said, I would love to. That's how much he believed in it. Shuka Dorfman believed in it. Every time I've shown this to anybody with any background in archaeology, they see what I'm talking about. I had a rabbi get up out of his chair in, in Jerusalem come over and pull me out of my seat and kiss me on both cheeks. Now, I tell everybody, Oklahoma boys don't like to be kissed, but I like that because he was validating our research and that's what I was excited about. So yeah, we want, we want to get back to digging. So if you got buddies, let them know. Next question. So Eve Benari has, a, has her hand raised. Eve, do you want to? Yeah, hi. <laughs> Uh, good evening. So, um, wait, uh, how do I lower there? Okay, so uh, a very, very informative uh, here uh, in educational things. Thank you very much, first of all. And uh, secondly, like I asked uh, at the writing, if the Jordanians are actually going to like um, hear about these uh, excavations and stuff that don't you afraid that they can ruin it all, you know, like uh, like they are, they are doing, doing right now at lots of lots of uh, areas you probably heard about. Um, and also the project that right now is uh, being held uh, with um, with a snapling, you know, with the Qumran uh, caves by the Israeli authorities. 
uh, yeah, they, they found them lots of uh, things there. Uh, how are they connected to the finding that you think they are there? The, if I understood you correctly, Mm -hmm. uh, the, your concern is about the uh, treasures being some damage being done to the ruins of Qumran. And yeah, that's always that's always a big concern, regardless of whether you're looking for treasures there or not. Yeah, but so, but, but maybe maybe we we should wait for Israel to make something politically, um, um, uh, you know, fa a fact that it's all. Hours, supposedly, or whatever, and then we should all dig, and, you know, so no one can take the credit for it or whatever. Yeah, and and I I agree with that. I think that uh, what we are doing now is you know, preliminary. It's getting ready for mm. the excavation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've still got to get permission, and I've tried going from the bottom up, and I actually got to dig at Qumran. Well, I under my supervision, they dug. And it was by Yuval Peleg. We actually dug at Qumran, it's like we were saying, but we only went down three feet, which is ridiculous. You're not gonna find anything at three feet. So mm -hmm. in order for someone to get out there and dig and try to recover these things, they've got, uh, except in one place, and I'm not gonna tell you where that is, it's, it's very deep. It's like uh, Jeffrey was saying. It's 12 feet deep and before you get to the treasures. So it, that Qumran is under surveillance 24 seven because they have, uh, they have electronic surveillance there. Matter of fact, uh, a rabbi tried to convince me to go out there and dig just to check it out. And he almost convinced me until I went out there because I was a scout pilot and I used to find, you know, how to get into a place without being seen, that sort of thing. But whenever I got out there and I looked at that, uh, Chris and I actually went out there to check it out and we were gonna try one spot to see if anything was there. But thank goodness, we, our judgment was uh, to not do that because we have a good reputation with the Copper Scroll Project. We try to do everything by the laws and under the supervision of Israelis because that's gonna be important. So we want to do everything and make sure that everything is safe and protected and your concern for those treasures is very, very much appreciated because we have to protect them. And I'm big on that. Next right, question. So, Jim, we're-, we're Thank you very almost, much. Thank you. Yeah, we're almost at time. We have, I have one more question here from Gerard. Um, he says, Vendel Jones died in 2010. How much of your current and detailed information did you have at the time you last visited with, ben, with Vendel? All of it. Yeah, when I last visited with him, I, I took it to uh, Granfield, I think, the end of the town, and I showed it to him, and he loved it. Uh, uh, he was he was very excited about it, but um, none of the things that he he thought uh, there was nothing that he thought I couldn't find it anywhere in, in the Copper Scroll. With all due respect to him, because I do have a lot of respect for the guy. And he also asked that the chief revenue support. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. Um, you know, the, I'm going to say one last thing, and, and I'll let J Jim then give his his last statements. Um, you know, when Jim did this dig, did the test dig, it was stopped all of the sudden, right? They mm -hmm. they dug, and and all of a sudden it was over. Um, so somebody up top gave an order to stop it. Uh, and just by the descriptions, and this is my opinion, and take it as you wish, but just by the descriptions of what could possibly be found in Qumran, that if we're, we're talking about finding temple vessels, the powers that be are very afraid of that. Mm -hmm. They would not know what to do if we found temple vessels. And if we found the, the Ark of the Covenant, the Aron Kodesh, uh, uh, they would be beside themselves, right? They would have no idea what to do. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, probably why this was stopped, that they believe he could be right. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for coming, Jim. I'll leave the last to you.
And Thank uh, you very much. please everybody know this, this uh, has been recorded and it will be uh, posted and, and you'll get a link to the recording. Hey, thank you. We, thank want to you. Get, we want to get as many people as possible to understand and know about this, and, and, I'll, and I'll close after this, is the more, especially people in Israel, know about this, the better off all of us are going to be. And we want to work with the chief rabbinate. We want to work. We've already been working with the, uh, the current Sanhedrin. Uh, they are well aware of what we're doing as well. We try to be above board. So ladies and gentlemen, please, if you got other people that want a presentation, I would like to have a little bit more time uh, to be able to share with you without having to rush so much. But I am very thankful to Jeffrey Cohen for, for doing this. And I think he, you're an amazing guy and very much appreciated. So guys, give me a hand. I don't want your money. I want your support. For you. Let's get these things out of the ground. Thank you so much, Jim. Have a great day, everyone. Can we, uh, one question. Are we able to get um, some sort of contact information? I've got some follow-up questions I'd like to ask. Can I email or something? Yeah, yeah. Let, me send, let me give my email. It's uh, um, cspebook at gmail.com. C is in copper, S is in scroll, P is in project. In the chat, yeah. Okay, and my wife just typed it into the chat too. So yeah, please write to me. I'd be glad to answer everything that I can. Yeah, you can also email thank you very much. You, you can email me. It's just Jeff at zahootinternational.com. And I'll get all anything you send to me. If for some reason you don't have Jim's email, I'll get it to him. Thank you very much. All right, be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.